I talked last time about the possibility of constructing, or the demonstration <coughs> rather, that one can construct an analysis, uh, uh, an explanation of the observed phenomena of consumer demand theory, uh, downward sloping demand curves, income and price elasticities, Engel's law, essentially all the, the general properties that a textbook in micro should develop. But I showed that this can follow from the stochastic properties of a whole and don't depend on uh, the details. And I mentioned last time that in fact in many disciplines, including physics, uh, there are no direct path from micro to macro. And one reason, which I didn't talk about so much yes, yesterday, but I want to mention, is that inevitably what happens at the micro level creates a macro pattern. But it is not uh, a simple translation. And so now we call that uh, emergent properties. In the old days, we used to call it dialectics. The, the, the part is greater than the sum of its whole. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and we call that dialectics. And if you don't know that, pick up, say, Mao's essay on dialectics or Lenin's essay on dialectics, and you talk about how quality, quantity, change, all of that. And the point now rediscovered uh, is that the interaction among individual elements creates, the interaction among individual elements creates properties of the aggregate which are different from the individual elements. So what does that mean? in practice. Let's say that you have, let's say you believe, as I argue, foolishly believe, that uh, uh, production functions operate at the level of a firm. I've argued elsewhere, and I didn't mention it in the book, but that uh, I don't believe that they're in the idea of a neoclassical well-behaved production function. Uh, but let's say you believe that. Then, if you had a simulation model of production functions at the micro level, and you allow them to interact, and each one of the production functions had some form, like a CES, or Cobb Douglas, or any one of them, the aggregate relationship will not be like that. In other words, aggregation doesn't just result in a sum of all the, inter in the individual elements, it shows a transformed shape. And in that chapter to which uh, my previous uh, lecture uh, was devoted, which is chapter three, I make the point that every good economist understands this. Uh, Milton Friedman, when he talks about the theory of money and the demand for money at an individual level, he says, well, that this motivation, that motivation, culture, history, that, all of that. And in the end, he says, but when we aggregate, we're going to make the assumption that the velocity of money is uh, stable, Though it's not true for individual people, that's obvious. And we're going to make the assumption that there is a relationship, a stable relationship uh, between money and income based on a stable velocity of currency. Now that's an aggregate, and he's careful to say it's not true for the individual. So it's a result of uh, an emergent property. Keynes, when he's talking about uh, 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 consumption, says, well, individual people consume in many different ways. They have uh, class behavior, personal behavior is a question to worry about the future, transaction demands, all kinds of factors that determine their decision to hold money or to consume income. But in the aggregate, he says, I'm going to assume that the relationship between aggregate consumption and aggregate output is a simple one. Consumption is a function of output, maybe in wealth. And all the other factors cancel out. Now, this is legitimate. Because the individual factors vary across individuals and can cancel out. And what remains is the factor that's common to all, which is income, maybe wealth, something like that. So it's not surprising that aggregation creates a different shape to the function. That's a key point. It's an emergent property, the shape and the relationship itself. Is that point clear? Because I'm going to move on, but it's going to reappear when we talk about um, profit rate and all of that. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Isn't it strange um, the aggregate um, kind of uh, assumption that we made for the uh, um, model yesterday um, was the, that it's um, a plane curve? That the. Uh, the, the 
uh, yeah, the propensity to consume out of disposable income, yes. Well, as I said, the assumption is true of many different micro foundations, so that's an important point. So if you look across, let's say we examined your personal consumption over a year, right? How much pizza, how much this, how much that, and, and we would say, well, in any moment of time, uh, people vary. They go from one food today, one next tomorrow, depends on their budget, their tastes, and some people will have the same food every day, other people insist on having a different one. But when you get an aggregate, when you get aggregates, you get stability in the mean. And that's just a general property of aggregates because what one person changes here, another person's there. So I'm hypothesizing, that as we find in many, many different uh, um, uh, investigations, that aggregates tend to have a distribution with the mean, and the mean tends to be stable. That is to say, uh, it doesn't change much over time, or if it does, it changes in a determinate way. So by positing that the average propensity to consume out of disposable income is stable, you're setting up a stable relationship between income and consumption. That's another way of looking at that, right? And by showing that, you, at, at, a, at the level of the individual person also, uh, I mean, uh, the aggregate, you show that the aggregate demand curve will be downward sloping for necessary goods and consumption go uh, for uh, luxuries and all of those properties. So the only thing you need to assume, uh, only anything you deposit is a stability of a uh, distribution of outcomes. And that's a very well known phenomena in a variety of disciplines, physical, biological, and so on. Groups tend to have a lot of variability among individuals, but surprisingly the mean is very st stable. So if I were to take like the average height of a class, I wouldn't expect every class to have the same average height. But if I take the population bigger and bigger, the class will approach the population mean, which is surprisingly slow moving over time. Doesn't mean it's fixed. And later on in that chapter, I talk about factors that can change it. But clearly the change in the mean has to be reflecting changes in the individual. So it's not going to be a rapid change. It's going to be a kind of slow, uh, evolutionary change, if, the, if it is at all. And, and by the way, the average height of people in uh, capitalism has changed over time because better diet has caused the average height to drift upward. But it's not that it happens in a day, it happens over generations. So we can allow for the, the propensity to change, so to speak, and we need to ask how, what determines it. But we can't posit that out of our head. We have to look at those determinants and look at the empirical evidence and have a hypothesis about that that we can test and modify, okay, about the average. And that hypothesis is actually an aggregate consumption function, another way of looking at that hypothesis. I did it for a market, a given market. But you can look at that over time in different markets and you would expect to see in some cases it would disappear. For instance, the consumption of horseshoes is definitely going to have a downward sloping, uh, downward drifting propensity to consume. And when we move to cars, they're gonna be very small propensity consumer of horseshoes, right? So that's all, it provides space for all of that. And the question's a good one because we then have to say what are the social forces determining that, factors going into it. But my main point is that individual variations tend to cancel out. And what remains is the commonality. What's a commonality? Income. You can't consume without income. And that becomes a very important common feature. Yes? So uh, in, in, if you had a very equal distribution of income, would the, the flows of the demand be more horizontal? Uh, no, not necessarily at all, because uh, I didn't posit anything about the distribution, only the stability of the mean. I didn't okay. say anything about the standard deviation. But that's a question, yes. We could ask that question. Is there anything, but given the stability of the mean, all the results were derived only from the stability of the mean, not from the second order uh, issue of the, of the st uh, standard deviation. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that there are phenomena in which that becomes important, but not for at consumption functions at the level of the demand curve uh, story. It might be very important. For instance, businesses care about that. 
because the sensitivity of, of the <coughs> add to advertising all depends on whether people are clustered here or you can pull some of them together. You can change the distribution by affecting their tastes and their preferences and all of that. And I don't want to argue that these preferences are given. What I'm saying is that they are stable in the large because they are socially structured. <coughs> and social structures don't change very rapidly. There are instances, by the way, uh, well-known instances where they do change very rapidly. I remember that after September 11th, the U.S. mounted uh, 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 attempt to, was it September 11th? Maybe it was the Iraq War. The U.S. has so many wars, it's hard to keep track of this, but in one of those wars, I think it was uh, Bush wanted to get a coalition of uh, countries who would go into the war. Might have been Afghanistan, might have been Iraq, I can't remember, but anyway. France didn't join the coalition. And when France did not join the coalition, some Americans were so angry that they wouldn't eat fries, which are called French fries. And other Americans uh, were not drink French wine. There was actually a guy in New Jersey who had a good seller of French wine, and he said in the newspapers, I'm going to pour this stuff down the toilet. People going, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, we can take it off your hands. But the fact is that his consumption changed dramatically for the personal, the break between the acculturated preference, and, and this happens in wars and social change of all sorts. So it, we don't want to make the assumption that this is given by nature. It's given by the social web of influences in that network, and these can rupture. And when they rupture, people can change very rapidly. This typically happens in instances like that. But by and large, they don't change very rapidly for that same reason. Yeah. I might be wrong, but is the model assuming that relative prices are like don't, don't affect the propensity you consume between luxuries and necessities? Yes. Okay. I, I showed, well, I'm not necessarily assuming that. I'm just simply saying even the existence of a stable propensity to consume derives all that we already know about these. So then we might find in individual cases that it might. It might be that people were convinced that something that's more expensive is worth more in some sense. That's a typical luxury good effect. But really, those are very localized. Um, it is true that it might be when iPhones first came out, that premium of $200, you got to have an iPhone. But now you've got 40 different competitors for the iPhone. And that's not, it doesn't work so well anymore, that particular argument. You know, the, 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 the scarcity of, of the fact that you have it. But it does work for some things. And we have to allow for that, too. So here's my point. All the things we're talking about are well-known social factors. And our theory should allow for that. But if we do allow for it, we get all the results, and I don't ever have to mention utility, optimizing, maximizing. I'm not assuming that people's consumptions are perfect. I'm not assuming that they make the right choices. I don't need to assume any of that. I don't have to assume away regret. I don't have to assume away mistake. And nor do I have to say, oh my God, I just discovered that people are not perfectly rational after 100 years. I mean, that's a kind of uh, stupidity that, that makes no sense to me. It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of discovery that indicates a deliberate ignorance. There's no way you couldn't know that. But you do it for tactical or career reasons to finally discover that people don't behave uh, in some way, as in our game theory, many of those game theory behavioral experiments, they finally discover that people care about each other. My goodness, it's a breakthrough. Okay, yeah. Um, would you say that stability of the mean would apply to all economic aggregates, including investment? Uh, yes and no. So here, interesting question. I haven't come to that, but I'll anticipate. I'm going to argue that what motivates uh, one of the important things in, in competition is profitability. And if you're talking about competition between industries, capital will flow from one to the other according to the rate of profit. And in fact, according to the difference between the rate of profit and the interest rate. Because if, if it's uh, not above the interest rate, there's no point. You can get the interest rate by sitting at home. You get the profit rate by risking the battle. So that difference, which is very central in the classical e economics, especially in Marx, the difference between the profit rate and the interest rate, motivates the lateral movements. Now an interesting question arises. Is there a stable investment function? 
that's, a, that's one way of putting the question, right? And the answer is, we don't expect it to be stable forever, but we do expect, if these are social factors, that the primary determinant of the moves of investment will not be changes in the, in the animal spirits, but rather in the profitability. And that's a hypothesis you can test. You can look to see whether there is a stable investment function over time, and we do that in the book, actually. On the other hand, I don't expect it to be stable independent of social factors. I don't expect it, for instance, to be in, un, unaffected by the oil price hikes of 73 and 79, nor do I expect it to be unaffected by a war. If you are the receiving end of a war, well, obviously your expectation of a profit rate is dependent on your evaluation of what's going to be left standing. So I don't expect it to be true in that case. And we see across the world now, especially in the Middle East, you know that the, 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 the town or the culture of the society may not be standing. We're not going to invest because the expectation of profit is the expectation of, of demand, of sales, of people, all of those things. So it's a subtle thing, but it's quite remarkable how in a stable climate that will be stable. We don't expect it to be true in an unstable climate. Another reason why we don't derive it from utility and all of that. And Keynes, by the way, is the one who says this. You know, if capitalists think that the future is uncertain, they're not going to hold back. Well, of course, that's very sensible. You, when you invest, you're throwing your money away, right? And you're saying, as Marx puts it, you throw it out and then you hope to fish it back later. Well, if you're, it's not going to come back. If you think it's not going to come back, you won't throw it away, regardless of the promise of the rate of return, because the promise is not just of a rate of return, it's of the conditions of return. So, in business literature, by the way, talked about this all the time. We need to be able to explain how businesses operate rather than accusing them of not operating properly because we have a really bad model and they don't fit it. The job of the science is to explain how things work, not to accuse bacteria of being bad. Yes? Um, many economists uh, would claim that demand is cyclical and this, uh, or sorry, investment is cyclical and this Very good question. So here's the way I would ask that, answer that question. How do you know that it's not due to the cyclicality of profitability, which you can measure? Well established, by the way, why that happens. And this is even discussed in Smith and Ricardo and Marx, and so it's not new. Uh, business cycle, Wesley Clare Mitchell, and all his whole work was about tracking this. So what happens in a business cycle? You have a boom. In a boom, wages begin to rise. Uh, Profit margins begin to shrink because it, as the wage rises relative in real terms, you get a fall in the profit margin and the profit rate begins to shrink. Now as you approach, that effect causes the boom to turn around and become a downturn. That's cyclical and it's objective, it can be measured. Now we can ask how much of that is not, uh, how much of investment does not reflect that. But if you don't do that part, you won't have any way to talk about it. It's not true that capitalist profit rates fall because they expect them to fall. They fall and the expectation begins to change. Uh, let me give you another example of this. George Soros, who knows a little bit about money and finance, proposes what he calls a theory of reflexivity. And the idea is that, uh, I'll give you the example in stock markets, it's easier, but it applies to everything in his estimation to society in general. If I think, if I can persuade enough of you that there's a stock that's going to go up, enough of you to buy that stock, it'll go up. Right? So we can say that our expectation, if they are acted on, will cause the actual thing about which we have an expectation to change. So we expect it to go up, we invest in it, it goes up. Then Soros asks the question, well, if that's the case, why doesn't it just stay wherever it is? Because after all, if you expect it to go up, it goes up. 
He says, well, I, George, make my money by catching this wave. And what's the wave? When it goes up, the actual price goes up because I expect it to go up. The fundamentals, which are heavier, so to speak, don't change very much. They can, but they don't go up to the same degree. And so what a wave does is create a greater gap between the actual and the fundamental. And so says, I'm watching that gap. I'm looking to see when I think it's the, the actual has gone far enough away that people are going to start to say, now it's not sustainable and they start to bail out. Hopefully, he says, I try to be the one to bail out at the top, but then I bail out as people bail out as I do it. Other people are certainly going to pay attention, and they do it, and the whole thing comes around. So that's animal spirits, right? But that animal spirits is not just in your imagination. It's based on your estimation of the sustainability of the outcome. And so we need to be able to talk about that. And the stock market literature is full of tricks of short-term cyclical indicators, of uh, various things that, uh, that chartists use, uh, who chart these trends, look to see when the top has come and when you get out. That's objective, but it in, it's the object of in, uh, subject of interacting. And I think that's proper. But now suppose you had a false theory that said that there is no such thing as a boom. You just get a boom because people feel happy, and then they get depressed and it comes down. In fact, I, I've actually seen explanations of depression that say that, well, you get a boom when people are enervated, and then they start to lose that stimulus, and then they start to come down, and on the way down, then everything falls apart. I don't, I don't believe in that. I do believe that uh, our estimations are based on objective factors, and we differ. That's another point. Everybody has their own estimation. There's no representative agent. It's a fiction. There's no calculation. You're guessing, and this is Keynes's point. You're guessing about what other people are guessing. But you're not guessing only about what they're guessing. You're guessing about what they're guessing about the profit rate, which is an objective phenomenon. And that's the anchor. And I'm going to use that to anchor Keynes' own argument, because Keynes famously talks about this part, the Soros up reflexivity part, but he doesn't talk about the Soros fundamental part. And you know, I'm not saying, I'm not blaming Keynes. Keynes did extraordinary. There are, in my opinion, four economists in four centuries worth noting. Smith, Ricardo, Marx, and Keynes. One for each century. So if you're planning to be one, this is your century. It hasn't been decided yet, but the others are taken. And you, I'm arguing that there's a, unitary, there's a unified field theory that you can extract from their work that explains a huge number of phenomena with very simple uh, principles. And on the other side, many people misread either their arguments or misstate them deliberately. Uh, and then they say, well, it's not true because Smith said this. They're, they're taking phrases out of context. For instance, invisible hand. Poor Adam Smith. If he had not used that phrase, people would actually read Adam Smith. But he used invisible hand, and it suddenly became general equilibrium. There's nothing like that, not a thing like that. He uses about propensity to truck and barter. Everybody says, see, he says people are selfish. He doesn't say that. Uh, at the New School, we force you to read the history of thought, whether you want to or not. Because it's by uh, reading those people that you realize how much smarter they were than we know, and possibly how much smarter they, are, they were than we are. And that's a good way to proceed. Imagine that a course in music, and you're not allowed to read, not listen to Mozart or Beethoven. Only rock and roll? Well, that'd be a limitation, in my opinion. Um, okay, other questions? So now I want to turn to the next subject, which is the theory of the firm. I'm sort of following the pattern of standard textbooks, and I ask you in your own thinking to try to think about a textbook that you use. How can you partition the pages into which parts are observable phenomena, and how much of it is actually into just the theory and interpretation? The interpretation, I mean the following. You find the pattern, and you say, ah, oh, that's imperfect competition. Well, only if you believe in perfect competition. But since I don't think it ever existed and has any meaning at all, to attribute something to imperfect competition is just to tie yourself into that church. I want to show you, on the other hand, that competition is very fundamentally important. And that's the key point of neoclassical theory, to say that competition is an important role. We have to then say, what does competition look like? And I'm going to call this real competition so that I can distinguish it from perfect competition. 
Is that point clear? I'm going to emphasize that again and again. Okay. First of all, when we're talking about the profit motive, we're talking about capital. And I'm talking about the laws that operate in capitalism. Those are the four economists that I'm talking about. Not just all societies and nothing of that sort. So what is capital? Capital is essentially uh, uh, the investment of money to make more money. That's profit. MCM prime. And that's, by the way, not just for Marx, but Keynes says, ah, yeah, that's right. That's a circuit of the important point of Marx, that capital is money invested into activities with the purpose of making more money. And the, the task that Marx sets himself is to explain where that profit comes from at the aggregate level. Individual level, it's okay. If it means I cheat you and you lose in that game, I mean, that's okay. It doesn't add up to uh, net profit, or if it does, it's profit on transfer. Marx wants to demonstrate that he has the secret of where this comes from. And the answer is the production of a surplus product. We know that. But more importantly, that the production of a surplus product comes through the extraction of surplus labor. This is the key point that uh, is uh, Marx's contribution to the idea of profit, anyway, is it doesn't come because you get more after you put in and uh, you get more out, but rather that workers have to be induced to work longer than a certain amount of time for that surplus product to exist. Now, I don't know how familiar you, with the, you are with that. I don't know whether you've been exposed to that. So let me just give you the simple example, which I use in the textbook, by the way, in the book. Suppose you had a certain amount of uh, inputs corn and iron, let's say, right? Wheat and iron. And you had labor. And the labor is a number of workers. And you combine uh, uh, machinery you can skip because iron could represent machinery. So you have inputs and you have labor and you've got to pay the workers. So there's some corn and iron they need. And after that, you get an output. But Marx's point is that that output only comes if you get those workers to work. It's not enough to hire workers, you have to have them work. And so the question he says is how many hours before their length of the working day is enough to produce the corn and iron that went into the production either directly for raw materials or for workers. And the, the point he shows, and one can show generally analytically, there is always a length of the working day which will be just sufficient to reproduce the inputs. Now that sounds abstract. So think about it differently. Suppose that you had a business and you were making some money. Your workers come in and they like you or they don't like you, it doesn't matter. They work, uh, let's say, 14 hours a day. This is a business in, let's say, Asia right now, though it's the early uh, England and United States and France that all had the same length of the working day. So let's say it's 14 hours a day. And let's say they, they struggle and they create a union and the result of that is that their working day is cut from 14 to 12. Or let's say they go on strike. They go on slowdown, which is really where they say, OK, we're going to work, but we're going to work to rule. We move slowly from one place to another. If you've ever been in any union struggles, you know that slowdown is saying, we're not on strike. We're just following the rules. Well, if you slow it down, you quickly see that the output will go down. You have bought the inputs, they're not being processed at the same rate, and the output goes down. And you can imagine, conceptually, at how slow could they be before there is no profit for you, before the sales just cover your input costs. And this shows up in practice in union struggles and other things. I mean, in Puerto Rico, for instance, where the electricity is gone and people can still survive, perhaps working, they can't work enough to make a profit because they simply don't have the conditions. So that, for Marx, the key condition is the willingness of workers to be induced to work longer than a particular length. Let's suppose that length of the working day is four hours after which, at, at which uh, working time they could produce their conditions uh, for input and for their own consumption. So the whole point of capitalism is that they must be persuaded somehow to work longer than four hours. And how much? Well, obviously from the capitalist point of view, the minimum is four hours. The maximum could be as much as they can try. And that depends on the resistance of workers. Historically, it's always been true. They can drive them to the point of exhaustion. 
uh, in my book I cite uh, uh, a manufacturer in Massachusetts who says, I bring in these young men at 17 and by 25 I throw them away because they're burnt out and used up. They're no use to me and no use to anybody. <coughs> because I work them 16, 18 hours a day, and at the end of that time, they're, they're so destroyed physically by that labor, but that's okay, I have plenty more of them, so I can just take more. So that's the upper limit, the upper limit which always comes about through the imperative to expand the working day and the speed up of the working day, the intensity at which you work. Uh, but that upper limit is a physical one in the first instance, and it really is, in the first instance, physical. When the settler, when the Europeans began to invade uh, Latin America, uh, they took Native Americans and they worked them to death because they didn't really need them to reproduce. They needed them just to be worked until they died. Chinese laborers who imported will also be worked essentially to the point of exhaustion and breakdown, and then you could throw them away. Not true of slaves because you own slaves, and so you are paying for the whole length of the slave. But for a worker, you pay them for as long as you work them, and then they drop dead or break down or something, you get rid of them. So that's the intrinsic pull to go to the maximum. But of course, workers are not raw materials in that sense. They're not inputs in the neoclassical sense. They're active subjects, and they fight back. And that historical struggle to change the length and the intensity of the working days takes centuries. It comes little by little. The first time that they say, we propose a 14-hour working day, people go mad. No, capitalism will drop dead. It cannot survive on 14 hours. After all, I mean, we make our profit on the last hour. This is the thing in Marx, seniors last hour. I mean, we only make it on the 15th hour. So you cut it, and we'll not survive. <coughs> but capitalism does survive, because that is a, a space of contention, and over time, in advanced countries, the working day has gone from 16 to 15 to 14 to 13 to 12 to 10 to 8. And that's not because capitalists got nicer, it's because workers got stronger. So that key point is profit comes from that distinction between the necessary labor time and the uh, uh, length of the working day. And that labor time, Marx called surplus labor. Now you can formalize this, I do that in the book, the algebra is pretty straightforward. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that people who talk about profit and the surplus things, such as the Serapians, never once mention the length of the working day. They treat it as a physical property. They say you have workers and you have raw materials, they mention, don't talk about how long workers work, and then the output comes out. But that implies that the length of a working day is somehow fixed by technology, which it isn't. It's socially fixed. This is specifically true in Serapa, um, but it's true also in Kurtz and Salvadori and all. I teach a seminar in Serapa, by the way, so uh, this is very uh, fresh in my mind. We're just going through this right now. Okay, so the point there is that profit is what drives individual capitalists. Because if they don't make profit, they die. And so the incentive is not from some kind of abstract thing floating in the air. It's an operative incentive. It's a biological, it's a, it's a, a Darwinian selection mechanism in competition because competition is a war between workers and capitalists because this part of that comes, but also capitalists and capitalists because they also have to fight for space. They have to fight for market share. They have to fight for customers. And that part of the fight is dependent on their ability to be profitable and very crucial there to lower their costs. When you find someone saying, you know, 30% sale of something you want, you're likely to move, to flock towards them because of that difference in price. But how do they get 30% down? Well, sometimes it's just a trick to bring you in there. Most often it's just a trick to bring you in there, just buy other things that are not on sale. But people who can lower the costs relative to their competitors, keep it below, will steadily attract customers and it will wipe out the ones with the higher costs. So price cutting and price setting are the two characteristic features of competition as a war. And I'm going to come, come back to this in a minute, but this is the key to real competition. It's between workers and capitalists 
for that length and intensity of the working day and you know, all of that. And it's also between capitalists and capitalists because if they are in the same market, they try to get, they beat each other. And this is not new. There's no business textbook I know of, no business literature I know of that doesn't talk about competition as warfare. But notice there that these are activities. They're not passive. They are price, prices are set by firms. As Marx puts it, firms set a ticket on the goods they sell. A ticket meaning a price tag. It's a British term for the price tag. So when you go in to buy something, you look at the price. Well, that price doesn't come from a wall region auctioneer. It comes from the seller. And then you have to ask, why does the seller charge that price? And the answer is, they're trying to attract customers and keep customers. And at the same time, they'd like to charge as high a price as possible. So that brings us right away into the first dimension of the conflict, which is every seller would like to sell at the highest price, but on the other hand, they know the lower the price, the more customers they attract to the market itself. And secondly, the more they attract from others. So there's a competition of sellers for, for customers. Lower the price, more, more of us are going to be coming into shops everywhere. But if your price is lower than theirs, I'm going to come to your shop more often than I will theirs. So that lateral difference is what forces prices to stay within line. Because your prices are lower, they're going to have to cut theirs because their customers are walking out the door to you. And so that creates a tendency for prices to equalize among, cost, uh, among sellers of similar goods. Now, equalize, I'm going to talk about what that means. Does not mean <coughs> become equal. It means a pressure. I saw your hand first, yes, yeah, so please. Uh, so in that process, what is the role of the differentiated products? Meaning that you take like, you have a water and also you have the water with different color that sort of sell like in a slightly beer price. Um, Okay, so, uh, save that question until I talk about how, how this works because a lot of that comes from people thinking that it means that all prices will be equal. I don't want, I'm not saying that. So I want to show you even if you had apples that were roughly the same quality. Outside where I work at the new school, there's a farmer's market every Monday and every Wednesday. Now I walk around the farmer's market looking at prices, you know, thinking about my class. Prices are roughly the same. Now, not apples, or all, all apples are equal, but now they're all organic. Uh, nobody would dare sell you anything else in, in New York City. And prices are roughly the same for similar products. And sometimes they're products which are not similar. And then there is a different price for them, you know, certain types of chilies that almost nobody buys, but there is a price set for them. So I want to come back to that. But the first question is, prices that are roughly similar will be forced to line up with each other so that you're not going to spend your time looking. And it's very clear. If, if I walk across four farmer's market things, the apples and fruits and all the vegetables, and one is selling them for $10 and the other is selling them for $1, it's pretty clear where I'm going to go. So that forces them already. They know that. I mean, they're, they're active subjects too, so they totally know. They have to keep in track. So what they have to do is to have a price differential that they can get away with. And that is an issue which I want to come back to what allows them to get away with it. Okay? One thing is to persuade you that it's worth the price differential. Sometimes they're nicer to you. Well, that's worth something. But those differences are really small. You'd be astonished at how, difference, how small they are. And if you're talking about a product which is essentially the same, a particular computer or something like that, it's amazing how small those differences are. There's always a, a distribution. There's always a mean, and it's pretty stable. Though it changes over time, but uh, the local concrete factors account for the variation. The main point is that the competition accounts for the fact that they are bound together. And what I mean by bound is the following. I can observe the prices of these every year, as I do, uh, apples, let's say. But in some years, it's a bad harvest. The apples are scarce. Then the price of apples goes up, but everybody's price goes up because they're more scarce now. The, 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 the supply has gone down. And so the price distribution may not change, but the mean moves. And I can, we can explain that. Uh, I will come back to that to remind me. Yeah. Uh, so how do you criticize uh, the argument in Berlin that cities need more of a capital in terms of uh, pricing? 
Uh, uh, which argument? Well, uh, Stevie Zambotto's uh, argument about pricing in one Ah, OK. Time. I do spend a lot of time that in the book, but let me first lay out this argument because I haven't laid it out yet. And if uh, the phenomena are going to be, many of the phenomena that they mistake for monopoly are necessary parts of the dynamics of competition. So I'm going to show you that, and then we can come back and remind me of that too. In the book, I actually have a section which I'm going to be skipping, which is a history of theories of competition, a history of theories of imperfect competition, and monopoly power beginning with Hilfeding, and moving forward from Hilfeding to Sweezy, Baran Sweezy, Kaletsky, uh, all of those people. So I, I talk about them at length, including what led them to believe that this is monopoly rather than competition. But first, we have to explain what competition looks like. Otherwise, we have no way of knowing. Okay. So I, the point I made so far is that competition is a struggle of capital against labor, but capital against capital. It's also, by the way, a struggle of labor against labor, a non-trivial point. If there's a, a reserve army of labor, or even if there isn't, workers are competing with each other for jobs. They compete with each other for better jobs. So competition is something in which everybody is set against everyone else. The struggle of all against all. And this is a, a very important point because it makes it seem as if it's natural, it's part of nature and society, but it isn't. It's a particular expression of a particular society, and that's an important point. In other societies, you might compete in different ways. You might compete in warfare. You might compete in jousts. But in capitalism, the competition is profitability, wages, prices. So we're going to talk about two types of competition for firms. The competition among sellers of the same goods. So let's say. Uh, this table is one set of goods, that's another set of goods. So these folks here are going to be selling apples. And they're going to look around and see what they're selling, each other selling, what the market will bear. So they set prices, but they set prices with an eye on their competitor. That's actually Kolecki's pricing equation, indeed. That's how he says it. They set prices according to their costs and with an eye on the prices of others. That's correct. But it doesn't follow that that relation is a fixed one, which is Kolecki's. Mistake. So now we have another set of people uh, selling lettuce, and another set selling uh, iPhones, and another set, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, iPhones, uh, and another set selling steel, industrial steel. All of those people are selling to customers. And they, customers are looking around for the prices of these goods also. So there is that pressure to keep your prices within bounds. And this does not imply equality. It implies boundedness of prices. So it's not the law of one price. It's the law of roughly equalized prices, roughly equal prices. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example of that, too. Uh, my parents lived and uh, passed away in Canada. And I was in New York. And when computers were first becoming hot, which is a long time ago, in the 70s, 80s, my, my father wanted a computer, then my mother wanted a computer, and computers in Canada were roughly twice the price, or very much higher, maybe not exactly twice, what they were in New York. Why? Because there were big tariffs across the border, and there's a transportation cost. If the computers are produced in the Midwest, or in, shipped to New Jersey, and then shipped to, to Toronto, and from Toronto to Ottawa, the cost is going to add to it in itself, but also there were big trade barriers. Now, Canada was not a big computer producer, so it was importing these goods. And the price differential added up to roughly double cost. NAFTA eliminated those tariffs. And then, immediately, the prices in Toronto and the prices in New York were effectively the same, except for transportation costs and tariffs. But that's competition. Competition doesn't say that going from here to there, the, the land will be flat. It just says that if you're going from here to here, the profit rate differential there has to be high enough for me to climb the hill. And so we have to take hills into account. We have to take the concrete factors into account. But we can also say for any given hill, there's always a difference that's big enough for capital to flow. That's what means it's competition, that that hill uh, is just a condition 
of the competition, the terrain. But it doesn't mean the absence of competition just because there are bumps or hills in the road. Um, so let me now, um, and, the, and the last point is that all of the, and the second equalization, so this is, uh, is equalization of prices and then equalization of profit rates between different industries. Now here, these guys sell apples and I notice that their profit rate is low and these guys are selling lettuce and their profit rate is high and the third set is selling iPhones and their profit rate is uh, medium. So there's going to be an incentive for capital to flow more into there. Now what does that mean, capital to flow? It doesn't mean new firms necessarily. It means new money. Because the capital is this MCM prime. And it could come from the guys who are not doing so well. I forgot whether you were doing well or not. But anyway, the ones who are not doing well could be the ones setting their money in. Because why should they put their own money back into something that's not doing well? They put it back into something doing better. Or it could come from new firms entering or a mixture of both. So the entry of capital into a high profit rate sector does not imply necessarily the entry and exit of firms. In fact, it can come indeed from the people who are themselves making the money. Who's the best place to invest in an industry? People are already there. What, why would they invest? Because they make money as profit with the purpose of making more money as profit. This is the key to the argument in Marx. M, C, M prime. M prime minus M is your profit. But that profit is now ready looking for another place to become M prime, C prime, M double prime, and so on. So the, the outward spiral that's inherent in the concept of profitability, it's self-expanding capital. Capital as a unit of self-expanding value. That's a key definition in Marx. Did, did and that tells you. Pardon? Did you say that moving the capital from a less profitable activity to a more profitable activity does not require necessarily an entry like this? Absolutely not. Suppose you were the most profitable industry. Right. And you just made a million dollars of profits. Yeah. Where are you going to put it? Into the least profitable industry or your own? My own. Exactly. So your capital enters, new capital enters. It may, in, and if your profit rate goes up, it'll grow more rapidly, your industry. Right? Because the profit is an incentive. You're always growing. You're, you're making money, you're putting it back, you're growing at a certain rate. Now your profit rate has gone up. You'll expand faster. So when you say industry is growing, you mean the size of investment in it is growing? Or? Uh, yes, the entry of new, what I call capital, so let's say plant and equipment. Right? New employment, all of that happens. Or oil production, you know, oil price goes up, Texas new production. They don't actually drill, they don't create new companies in Texas, right. they just hire more people because there's profits to be made there. It could be the number of firms, it could be the size of the firms, it could be the number of plants that a firm owns. That the firm is just an ownership entity, but the number of plants that it owns is a different matter, right? So if there's profit to be made with selling discount goods and Walmart moves into your neighborhood. If Walmart's doing really well, it moves into the next neighborhood too. Or Starbucks is an example of that kind of uh, movement, right? Yes. But now assume that the, the road that the carbon to flow to another industry exists, no? Yeah, that, what is it? The road uh, exists, like it's, so it's an open road to go or carbon to move. Uh, I mean, for example, <coughs> let's assume that there is a industry that is only a state owner in one country. Uh, and capital cannot uh, invest in that, in, that, in that industry. If that industry has a high profit rate, capital cannot flow there. No? Okay, so the, the two issues here. The idea that capital is somehow this impotent little thing that cannot invest. Well, you have to ask why cannot invest. Sometimes people say, well, the scale is too big. Big for what? It's certain every capital is too big for me because I don't have the money. But it doesn't mean it's too big for capital in general. So if you don't have the money, it doesn't mean that someone else doesn't have the money. If there's a, is there a need, you will see the entry. I'm going to cite the examples from business, uh, from the business cycle, uh, from business, Harvard Business Review literature, where they do a study, for instance, of many different industries, and they find the same thing. When the profit rates are high, bang, money appears. Money doesn't have to come from any individual. Banks will lend you money. They'll create the money. They create credit for you to do it. 
So the question becomes, what prevents capital? It's not other firms, because whatever other firms can do, some others can also do. It has to be something that is the, the, either a government prevention, they say no foreigners can come, well, but then local firms can do it. That usually is not to protect entry, it's to prevent, prevent entry by people outside and to protect you so that you can enter inside. So the conditions of this are very rare. Perhaps you have a secret process, right? And no one can copy it, like Kentucky Fried Chicken. They have a secret process. So what did they do? They bought Kentucky Fried Chicken. They just bought a whole damn thing. They took away the process. They made him, uh, the guy who did it, Colonel Sanders, was actually, not Bernie Sanders, <laughs> Colonel Sanders, actually made them promise that they wouldn't change the formula. And they swore to it. They bought the firm. Two years later, they put all kinds of chemicals and changed in the formula. And he said, you promised me. And they said, so sue us. We now own the company. So that's one way of entry. You buy the firm. Uh, the real question is, what are the conditions under which capital cannot enter? And scale is not a condition, absolutely. Because if it's big enough for some capital, it's going to be big enough for other big capital. They'll come looking. The one condition is if it's too big for any capital, like going from here to Mars. And there, typically, the state builds the roads, does the railroad from here to Mars, and then capital will enter. And capital will push the state to create the railroad, or the road, or the space path to Mars so they can enter. So yes, there are such things, but they are uh, not the way that they conventionally portrayed, which is that, you know, oh, this firm created a little barrier to entry, and it can leap over this little barrier. The road is too bumpy. There's no such thing. But it do, it pull up at the, the overshooting of the time. Indeed. Indeed. And if I'm going to come to that. I'm exactly going to come to that point. How does scale affect entry and exit? But it affects it because it's lumpy. That's all. I mean, you know, uh, you can buy, uh, the example I would give, a photocopy shop are pretty cheap. You can, you can set one up for, I don't know, $50,000 or $100,000. You, you buy the equipment and all the copiers. And so you enter pretty rapidly. If it turns out that photocopying is, is hot, then you set one up. Well, a chemical plant costs $100 million. So if there's a hot chemical plant industry, you're going to expand mostly from the existing chemical plants because the scale of the, the lumpiness of the entry. But if it's rising enough and you think it's going to rise enough, bang, they come in. And they may be wrong about that, and then those plants go out of business. But they, they have to make the expectation that the whole uh, investment will come back. And that's just a concrete factor. It's like a runner running along the ground and looking to see, OK, this, the ground is flat. I run flat there. It's a little bumpy. I'm careful. A, a hurdle. I jump over the hurdle. But there are very few hurdles that capital cannot jump over. And that's something we see in the history of it. So that's a very important thing. One more question. I've got to move on. Yes? So do you apply this to um, the movement of capital between different countries as well? Or is, it, is this like within a country? Well, that's a very good point. Because then the question is, what prevents them moving? There are some cases where they're blocked. But often it's transportation costs and costs of labor and uh, infrastructure and all of that. And sometimes they create it. Yeah. Um, but then, like, I think this is also argument of models like solo model that um, capital would move to countries with higher return, and then we would see convergence between underdeveloped and developed. Okay, so I'm going to come. To, I'm going to show you that that's not true. And so, and the, the mistake is a convergence between profit rates of industries and profit rates of firm uh, of countries. And so let me get there. That's one of the points I want to stop, stop at. at the, I'm already an hour into this. OK. I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, so the first point I want to make is that all industries, in any industry, there will always be a spectrum of costs uh, because, just a new one, yeah. Oh, this, yeah. Because the, the idea of that firms set prices and they cut costs, I mean set prices, and they cut prices to attract people to have sales and lower prices, but you can't really maintain a lower price unless your costs are lower. 
And so they have a tremendous incentive to lower costs. One is to push down on wages, but then the equalization of a movement of labor will again prevent that as being a general advantage unless it's in another country, and I'm going to come back to that. But the other way is that they can change the technology. Now when a new technology comes in with lower costs, it can lower prices and gain market share, but it begins to drive out the older technology, because the older technology will have higher costs, and at any given price, it's going to have a lower profit margin. So here's an example. All uh, the price is 100 in the market, but the costs, the oldest has 82, 80, 78, and 76, right? So these are the spectrum of technologies that are created by capitalist competition itself. It's not exogenous. They invent technologies to lower costs, and at any moment of time, they're old ones and new ones. That's just like saying people are born and people die. So you'll be very surprised to say there's a person of a single age, a representative person if you're neoclassical, but there cannot be any such thing, because people come into existence and they go out of existence. Same thing for firms. Then the profits will then be the difference between the price and the cost, the profit margin, and that will mean that uh, this uh, capital, it may not be a firm by the way, it may be a plant. It could be all in the same firm, or it could be different firms. This capital will have a profit margin of 18, this one 20, 22, 24. Now it doesn't follow that their profit rates will follow from that, because it depends on their capital stocks and output. If uh, lower cost firms have bigger scale of output and a bigger scale of capital stock, then it's possible that the profit rate, which is the profit margin uh, divided by the capital per unit output, could vary across firms. I made up these numbers just to illustrate the point that the fact that profit margins are higher for lower cost firms doesn't imply that profit rates are higher, because profit rates are more concrete. And that's going to become important at some point. So let's suppose that we have this uh, spectrum of profit rates, we have the spectrum of profit margins, and the key point is that equalization of prices will create disequalization of profits. Necessarily because technologies are different and costs are different. And the cost differences are created by capital itself, not out of the sky. So now we can ask the question, what happens if the lowest cost firm, here we have a lowest cost firm, and I made the example in such a way that the lowest cost firm actually has the lowest profit rate. So you might say, well, what's the point of having lower costs? You have a lower profit rate. And the answer is, these lower costs allow you to inflict more damage on them than they inflict on you. It's like asking, what's the point of having a nuclear weapon? I mean, hell, it's going to kill a lot of your own people. And you say, yeah, but it's going to kill a lot more of the other people, and that's why it's an effective weapon, because the damage in a warfare, it's a question of who sustains more damage and less damage, not a question of sustaining damage. Both sides are sustaining damage. So suppose that this firm, the, this new capital came in, these prices are 100, and it finds its profit rate is a little bit below the others. But suppose it lowers its selling price. Now it can go down to 76 as a warfare tactic, but let's say it, pick, it picks a roughly 90. Then its profit margins will go down, but so will the others. Its profit margin goes down from 24 to 14, but the other goes down from 18 to 8. And you can quickly work through the calculation. The profit rate is now the highest or second highest for this firm that was previously lower, because by setting its price, it can make the others give up. You can see this. If it lowered the price, to 82, then this capital is out, because it's making no profit. You don't need to go that far. You only need to make its profit rate equal roughly to the interest rate. That's called the scrapping margin. You don't want to keep it going. You don't want to keep investing in a, in a business that's not making any more money than if you left it in the bank. So you could make its profit rate come down to the point where it, and maybe the second and the third, know they're doomed because they know that you have the capacity to undercut them. This is the Walmart strategy, the Costco strategy, all of that. And it's absolutely the dominant one. It's always been from the beginning of capitalism. It's not something new. It's always been true. So here you have price setting behavior, price cutting behavior, and price cutting in order to gain market share.
can make you actually the highest profit rate. And then people say, well, but why would you do that? Your profit rate will go down. And the answer is because you gain the whole market, you gain much more profit, you take over the whole market. And the fact that your profit rate goes down doesn't mean anything because theirs goes down more and you can ensure that they die. So it's exactly like asking, you're in a war, Germany versus Russia, but we don't want to actually hurt anyone. And we especially don't want to get ourselves hurt. So we want this war in such a way that we hurt other people, but not, not us. And of course, they have the same incentive. You have to make a judgment about what costs will be, what uh, damage will be sustainable. And this is what firms do all the time. I'm going to come back to concrete examples you know, of firms operating that way. But I just want to make that point clear that it's inherent in the uh, concept of price competition. Yeah. This is a small question. Is it the, the assumption that, that, that firms are competing for, for, for getting the other firms out of the market rather than for greater profit? Yes. The firms are competing for survival and growth. But, the, but then the, why would they decrease their price if they're going to get a lower profit rate? Well, that's the point I just made. Suppose I say to you, look, you two are in a war. And they have gotten a better artillery. And they're going to attack you. And you know that. And you say, why would they do that? Because I'm going to fight back and I'm going to kill some of them. And they can say, yeah, but we're going to kill more of you. The purpose of a war is not to avoid damage. It's to inflict the most damage. And every business literature tells you exactly the same thing. I have lots of examples in the book of people saying, you know, that's how we compete. We want to kill them before they kill us. And by the way, that gives you an incentive to copy the same. But then the motive ceases to be profit. Motive is, no, it's not because it's, it's, uh, motive, motive ceases to be maximizing the profit rate without taking into account the amount of capital. Yes, you could be a small shop on the corner and have a high profit rate, right? You're not a player in that market. Unless you can get market share and you can get control of the market, you won't grow. The point is to make profit in a sustainable way that you can grow. And this is an evolutionary thing. It eliminates competitors. That's what evolution is about, by the way. It's not about maximizing your happiness or anything like that. It's survival and being able to create the conditions <coughs> for expansion and growth. Yeah. Uh, so I think this, I think this point, but I, I wanted to ask you this and I'll read this chapter in the book. Is, I mean, don't you start to see, I mean, for, there's only what is it, five firms, four firms. How you would start to see some kind of strategic behavior on the part of the actors. I mean, like Coke, we, the Walmart, one example, let's say Coke and Pepsi, they pretty much have a detente problem, where right, they're not cutting prices anymore. They're like, all right, we can both sort of live and let live in this, in this environment. I don't we believe that. No, 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 I don't think that's wrong. true. You're making the assumption that they're not cutting prices anymore, but you have to look at relative prices or at absolute prices. Remember, we're talking about, uh, I showed you those graphs earlier for exactly this reason. In an inflationary climate, is the huge rise in price in the post-war period due to Coke and Pepsi agreeing to raise their price, or is it due to something else? I'm going to argue that that inflation does not come from collusion or monopoly power. In fact, no serious argument can be made there, because we can see price rise. Argentina, you know, 1,000% in a year. So we know that there are other factors. So then in a rising climate, you don't know that they're not competing by price. In fact, they are all the time, as they will tell you, competing by relative price, relative to the price index. The price of Coke is much cheaper now in real terms than it was when I first started to drink Coke, which was a luxury item, by the way, in Pakistan, but later when I came here also. Same thing for ice cream, same thing for iPhones. Everybody will tell you, isn't Apple the only producer of iPhones? Well, look around. Android came within three, five years, bang, took away. It's the biggest market now, biggest producer of, of those types of phones. So there is no evidence that they're colluding. There is evidence that they're not able to kill each other. That's a different matter. In warfare, you get India, I mean, you get uh, Germany and France and Italy. They attack each other. They, some win, some lose, and then they're back. Next war, Germany, France, Italy, Russia. Yes, but that doesn't mean they didn't have a war. Count the numbers of dead. That's how you know whether it's a war. 
And that's exactly the point here. I'm, I, in the book, I have lots of examples, but I really have to move on a little bit because this is just the first part of the story. Um, I want to talk then about one thing which is very key, which is the cost structure. Because this, suppose all firms within the industry had roughly the same cost. I didn't make it as a flat line, but I make it as a spectrum because even if you all use the same technology, <coughs> You won't all use it the same way. It, you, some of you will be better than others. Some of you may have good location, better luck, things break. So you want to say that even if they had one type of technology, there would be a spectrum. But the key point is that if they have one type of technology, then the regulating conditions, the conditions of entry of new investment is going to be this kind of average. And it's expandable because you can build new plant and equipment at the same time. So if all of you had that, then the regulating condition, the conditions for new investment, is going to be that. We're going to look at the profit rate on the average capital in this case. But suppose that you had a situation, and this is the old thing of rent, in which the regulating conditions are now the highest cost. Why would that be? Well, Ricardo gives us that answer, and we know that from the theory of rent. He says, well, let's suppose that this is the conditions of production in the beginning. Uh, let's say when land was, uh, fertile land was widely available. So we produce agricultural goods here, and you keep expanding the production, expanding production, and then you hit a limit on that land. What's going to happen? You can't produce any more on that land, so the price is limited by that, and the price will rise. And it'll rise until it's beyond the price of production of the next land. When the market prices rise enough to make it justified, you bring the next land in, and the increased supply of next land will bring the price down, and now it'll fluctuate around a higher level. Now, when that land is fully utilized, then the price will rise again, and then it'll kick supply in for a new higher cost producer and it, you'll come back down. So the regulating conditions of production will rise over time, in Ricardo's story, if it is due to conditions which cannot be reproduced. Good land, second good land, and now the third land in use. And that leads Ricardo to say, well, but everybody's still producing, but the cost uh, that's regulating, or the price of production that's regulating, is here. That means the others are making excess profit. Because this one has got a normal profit, this one is selling at a normal at that same price, but its price it'll give you a normal profit is lower, so it's getting excess profit, and this one is getting an even higher excess profit, higher than the current price. Everybody follow me there? That's essence of the theory of rent. But notice here, rent is determined by competition. That was Ricardo's point. Rent is a competitive outcome when you have conditions of production that are not generally available for new investment. And there are other things. Patents are an example of that, but the patents are limited. So you, know, you have them for a while, and that's to protect your investment, they say, until they're released, and then the price goes down. And Marx's criticism of this was, that's all very well, but it doesn't follow that this is a historical thing. The new land may come in to be this, and then suddenly the old lands will be up here, and they may even be wiped out because the new land is cold, so you won't use the old land, you drop them out. It depends on whether you can fulfill the production demand from society, uh, uh, product demand from society, with just one land, two lands, or three lands. Now, I've made these lands not to be infinitesimal, but to have a, a duration, a, a spatial uh, component, so that we're talking about a quantity of land, not just an infinitesimal. So this is not a rising average supply curve. This is a lumpy one. And the lumpiness is a very important feature of real competition. Scale. Uh, scale, in this case, of type of land is very important. So that leads me then to the key point. Uh, there's a third type, I'm sorry, I forgot that, which is suppose you have in any industry three types of producers. Old technology, middle age technology, and new technology. These little dotted lines means that you can expand all of them. Because after all, you can always buy an old machine and 
or uh, produce an old machine and make some more. So you could expand this way. But if you have this available, you're certainly not going to do that for any new investment. So this is the expansion path. But if this one is available, then the expansion path is here. In other words, regulating capitals will look at these and say, well, I'm not going to come in at the highest cost one. That doesn't make any sense. If I can duplicate lower cost ones, and which is the lowest cost one I can duplicate? It's C3. So the general, generally reproducible lowest cost conditions are the regulating ones because they give you the biggest advantage, the biggest probability of survival in uh, competition. Okay? So, um, I want to show you then what the implication of this is. What I've just finished saying is that in any industry there will be an average here, B, and C. And these averages depend on the concrete factors. They depend on the spectrum of technologies, the spectrum of lands, or whatever. So they'll be different. Right? And So at any common price in an industry, you're going to get a spectrum of profit rates. I didn't say that properly again. Let me go back. In industry A, I have all different conditions of production. They're selling at roughly the same price, so I'm going to have a distribution of profit rates. Industry B, some other price is a different good. This is uh, apples. This is lettuce. They'll have some average profit rate. Industry C, which is steel, they'll have some price of steel roughly equated, and this is the average profit rate. But that's not going to tell us where the entry and exit of capital takes place because we need to know what are the regulating conditions. So if industry A is agriculture, we know the regulating conditions may be the lowest profit rate because that's the one you can expand. If industry B is uh, uh, the, what did I do here? I'm sorry. If industry A has the regulating condition at the average, it'll be here. If industry B has a regulating condition, the mistake here, I don't know what it is anyway. Uh, this is the regulating condition, industry B. and in industry C, the regulating condition may have the highest profit rate. So in that case, the equalization of profit rates takes place only for the regulating conditions. It does not take place for others. I mean, that may sound mysterious, but it isn't really. You're not going to invest in an industry if you think its profit rate is high. You're not going to invest in old technologies. You're going to invest in the lowest cost that you can because that gives you the chance of sustaining that. And so the cost conditions are determined here, are, are, are uh, specified here as a star. And this is the punchline. The equalization of profit rates will then take place because the regulating conditions in different industries will cycle around some common center of gravity. So this is a regulating condition in B. It's below average. That means that uh, capital will grow more slowly here relative to demand. So the price will rise and it'll come to a higher level. In A, it's above average, so capital will enter A, drive the supply up, lower the price, and so it'll come down. But that same process will now create a difference in these two, so the difference will reverse, and so you get a perpetual fluctuation in principle, and you'll see in practice perpetual fluctuations of equalization of profit rates of regulating capitals only. Is that point clear? That's very important. It's not averages. It's of the regulating conditions. And if you are an investor, uh, you would understand this. You look in the industry and you say, well, that one's doing well. So this technology is what we can use and, and move that. Or this. So we add that we, is what we give more money to. And the same thing if you're a bank. You're not going to give more money to someone using a backward technology. It doesn't make any sense. You have to give it to someone who's going to use the newest technology. Even if they're firm, has only backward technologies. They can add new plant and equipment. Yeah. Just to clarify, this will take us, this will, this will show us understanding if we just define regulating conditions. Again. Yes. Okay. Regulating conditions are the lowest cost, generally reproducible conditions. And you think of them in investment. Investment is reproducing some conditions, right? Or bringing in new ones. 
So that will be the target of investment, the target of entry, so to speak, in the process. And that's sort of determined by technology? You know, Lots of factors, location, technology. Those are concrete factors. Right. But they're, they're, if you were making an investment, you would know what they were. You would have to know. Now, an implication of this kind of equalization is turbulent equalization only of regulating conditions is that there's no reason why countries would have the same profit rate. Now you can see that because every industry has a spectrum of profit rates. And so if you have three industries with three spectra, it doesn't follow that uh, the average will be the same. One country could have the top part of the spectrum and the other a lower part of the spectrum. There's nothing that guarantees that every country will have A, the, s the best technology or the same spectrum and B, that the same distribution even of within an industry. You can have backward industries in one country and advanced industries in another or you can have good land in one in country and uh, bad land in another. So nothing implies here that either by region or country that profit rates would be equal. You cannot look there. Because the theory already tells you you're not going to find it there. You're going to have to look by industry. And that's very important. Is that point clear? Because often in the literature, Mandel, for instance, in his book on Marxist economic theory says, well, profit rates clearly don't equalize because looking across countries, you see they're not equal. But I want to show you they are equal uh, across countries because you're looking in the wrong place. So let me just summarize here and then move on to the data. What is the features of real competition? What are the features? First, competition within an industry so that people all produce the same good and they're competing with each other for apples, sales of apples. Price cutting behavior which is ultimately related, uh, uh, limited by operating costs. If you're going to have a sustainable price war, you might, by the way, give your product for much less than its cost. That's called a taste. The cigarettes you give out to young people. You go to uh, high schools and give them cigarettes, right? For free. You want a cigarette? Here is a packet of cigarettes. Dope dealers do the same thing, by the way. They're well schooled in the theory of competition and they know they can give things away because later you'll come back. So the setting price and the entry price doesn't have to be the sustainable one, but it is to get you hooked on the product, so to speak, right? So, uh, then the selling price of the firms will be tied to the price of the leader. Now who's the leader? The leader is clearly the lowest cost reproducible. That's a price setter. The ability to cut costs, dominate the market by it because their costs are lower. They cut prices. So the prices will be roughly linked of different firms within an industry. Regulating capitals are the price leaders, the ones who, uh, whose price others are forced to uh, uh, match because that's the, uh, the new lowest cost producer, then that means that non-regulating capitals are, have their profit margins determined by the price set by the regulating capitals. Their profit margins are passive because they have costs, but they can't determine the price. If they do, they lose shares, so they have to match the price. So their profit margins become endogenous. They don't set their profit margins. Uh, lowest cost productions have the highest sustainable rate of profit in the face of price cutting behaviors. Firms constantly cut costs and develop new technologies. You have a spectrum of unit costs and capital intensities within a firm as newer, older technologies are scrapped and new ones are brought in. You'll have unequal profit margins within a firm due to price equalization. You have unequal profit rates within, uh, uh, within an ind industry, as I said firm, industry due to profit price equalization and unequal profit rates due to price equalization. And you'll have a positive correlation between profit margins, uh, costs, and scale. Because if I, everybody's selling at the same price, the lower cost ones have a profit margin, higher profit margin. How do lower costs get there? Generally, lower cost means bigger scale of production. The Walmart is a lower cost than your local stationery store, your hardware store, because of the scale. And secondly, the higher in investment in capital. Walmart has a much higher inventory, much more machinery, and all of that. So, 
Walmart is more capital intensive. It's bigger capital, bigger scale, lower costs. That's how it wins. That's a key point. And that means that you get a correlation between profit margins and pro profit scale, even if everybody is selling at the same price. And so this is interpreted in the literature of post-Keynesian economics as proof of monopoly power. Because they assume that competition means everybody is alike. My point is that competition means that everybody will necessarily be unalike because they self-differentiate in order to survive. They mutate. That's a key point. Now, competition between industries. <coughs> It is. In fact, the ones who get there are the ones who do that. But then there's nothing in here that sort of like is sort of guiding that behavior in the sense that which is the firm that is actually regulating costs, which is being the most productive. There seems to be something in terms of price setting and No, no, I didn't say it. It's very important to understand that firms are constantly trying to innovate. They're constantly trying to reduce costs, create new technologies. Mm -hmm. But you don't know in advance which one's gonna work. No, it's I not like you pick it up off the shelf, you have to create it. And the ones that succeed are the ones that have lower costs. Absolutely. But I don't know the, in, the, in this framework, I, I just don't see it happening here in the way you describe the competition. Well, I'm, I'm talking about the fact that there is a constant birth and death process. Right. And the new firms come in with lower costs. And that's an imperative forced upon them by competition. So the business literature tells you in detail how that happens. I mean, you hire engineers. You pay people for research and development, all of that in the hope to get at this. But it doesn't necessarily work. I mean, drug companies are a classic example. They're looking for new drugs and lower costs or better drugs. Most of that money is wasted because it doesn't succeed. Oil wells, you're looking for a more productive oil wells. So you spend a lot of money. That part is extremely well known. Uh, I, I'm interested in showing you the implications of that part. But in the business literature, innovation is extremely well documented, so to speak. Okay, and in the book, I, I mean, I'm doing very condensed versions of this stuff in the book there. So, what is the implication of competition between industries? The implication is that the profit rates on regulating conditions are equalized, not on average. So, let's say that he is a, a regulating capital, he is a regulating capital, she is a regulating capital, she is a regulating capital. She is a regulating capital. Their profit rates, your profit rates will be roughly equalized. But the others will not because you have different costs and different profit rates. So the equalization of profit rates does not imply equalization across all firms or even across industries. Only across targets of entry of investment. Now, unequal profit rates therefore in any given year because even for regulating capitals there will be a cycling of the process. I talked about that last time. Average profit rates not equalized because the regulating ones are equalized doesn't mean the others will. The others will be different and so their difference will create difference in the average. Industries with higher regulating capital intensities have higher regulating unit profits. We said this before. If, the, if you are um, uh, if profit rates are equalized, then it follows necessarily that those which have e higher capital intensity will have higher profit margins. So if R1 is equal to uh, star is equal to uh, P, uh, I'm just going to write it as the profit margin over the capital intensity is roughly equal to the profit margin of the second one, these are profit rates, by the way. Uh, if these profit rates are equal, then those industries which have higher capital intensity must have higher profit margins. Otherwise, they wouldn't have equal profit rates. In other words, the implication of equalization of profit rates is that profit margins will be higher in more capital intensive industries for regulating capitals. But regulating capitals and the average profit rates are likely to be correlated in that respect. So we would expect to find 
that industries which are more capital intensive would have higher profit margins. But that is not a sign of uh, monopoly power. That is a necessary consequence of competition. Absolutely necessary. But when you mean by capital intensive, is capital that we to labor? No, capital per unit output. So uh, this is a, a profit rate is, is uh, I always take a yeah, marker, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, we did this before. P over K, which is P over Q and K over Q. And that is the profit margin per unit output, and this is the capital per unit output. Or you could divide it by sales, which is empirically what you do, capital per profit margin on sales and so on. Now this is important because when we look at the empirical evidence, we want to know how to know if it is contrary to competition or not, right? And that is a key point. Okay. I am going to skip this. I want to just talk about some evidence we have because this is important. Uh, this is a uh, study done by, a lot of this literature is in the business literature. Uh, so this is study by, done by Dhawan who is a business economist. He takes a large sample of firms. Uh, I forgot what it is, but it is several hundred by the time he gets it down. And he looks at them in terms of their size. Everybody with me? The size is measured by millions of dollars. So. Uh, Firms who are 0 to 25 as, uh, in terms of sales as, are small, 25 million are small. 25 to 250 million are uh, medium, 250 to 1 billion uh, large, and extra large is greater than 1 billion. And he looks at their profit rates, and the average profit rates are 13 here, 12, 11, and 10. So the larger firms have lower profit rates on average. And the, as he says, this is a very well known phenomenon in the business literature. But it is an interesting question. How, why would larger firms have lower profit rates? And the answer, which he does not dwell on, but you can get from his data, is if you look at the standard deviation of the profit rates and you look at their coefficient of variation, you see the larger firms have a lower coefficient of variation. In other words, Bigger firms are more stable in terms of their profit rates. But more importantly, if you look at the failure rate, small firms have a very high failure rate and the failure rate declines rapidly with scale. So large firms are dinosaurs, but dinosaurs don't die very often. Small firms are mice and they die a lot. So when you adjust for profit rate, uh, adjusted for failure or risk adjusted, you find that the profit rates are remarkably similar. They are around 10 to 11 percent. Now that is expected from you think about warfare. You have small tactical units, they attack, guerrilla warfare, big failure rate. You have these entrenched things, protected and all that. They may not win, but they have much less of a casualty rate. Right? So that's, we know that from history. Uh, then I did something with a data set which we had from um, 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 the big CompuStat data set. I had a sample which was uh, um, 39,948 observations. And, and much of the data there is good, but sometimes firms list negative assets or stuff like that because they don't want to bother to fill in the sheet. So you have to filter, you have to clean it up. But you still get close to 40,000. And what we looked at is the association between sales, costs, profits, and assets. Uh, for instance, this is the capital intensity uh, in relation to the, the, the ratio of capital to sales in relation to the size of the firm, which is defined by its assets. So. The larger size firms are more capital intensive. The larger size firms don't have higher costs or lower costs. Now this seems like a puzzle. If larger firms are expected to have lower costs, why don't larger firms here have lower costs? And that's because the hypothesis is that if firms go are bigger, their cost per unit margin, cost, I'm sorry, cost per unit quantity 
goes down. But their price goes down too because we saw that they can also set lower prices. So the cost over sales, which is the cost per quantity divided by the price, and this thing is going down, but this whole thing won over the price, or this one is going down, so the ratio of the two doesn't change very much. And we know this when we look more concretely, firms with lower costs have prices which are lower. And that lower price means that the cost per unit sales are roughly the same, but of course it means that they have bigger sales because in the warfare of the market they're able to maintain a much larger range, a much larger sales base. Costco is an example, Walmart, all of that. Then I want to show you one more thing. I'm going to skip some data, but we asked the question about countries. So this is profit rate data uh, across countries. And here is the average profit rate in world manufacturing for a bunch of sectors. The names of the sectors are down, uh, down below. What did I do? Yeah, the names of the sectors are below, so I will get to them in a second. But <coughs> you can see that the profit rates don't equalize. So if you look at world manufacturing by country, the profit rates are unequal. But that is not a surprise because we don't expect the world pro the profit rates to be equal. We expect the profit rates on new investment to be equal. And here the same country, the same industries, the same data, except we calculate the profit rate on new investment and you can see how much they go. This is food, textile, paper, minerals, so on, so on. And you can see the equalization around the average. The average is not some mysterious Srafian entity calculated by numbers. This is just the average. But the fact is they oscillate back and forth. So this is what it means to say profit rate equalization. And it's perfectly consistent with inequality of profit rates by country. I'm going to skip the other examples of this, US data, Greek data, uh, all of that because that's repeating the same point. And we have, I have a lot of data in the book. Um, I would say the, data, the book is about 40% data. Um, Okay. Um, yes. Um, so when you straight uh, like small scale sweatshops, so-called sweatshops, in terms of uh, scale and unit cost. Well, it depends on whether they are small scale or not. In China, they're not small scale. Indeed, in the United States, in the beginning, they were the scale. They were everybody was sweatshops. So the question then becomes: Are sweatshops reproducible conditions? And the answer is no because they are generally based, in, in, the, in, in the Western world, they're generally based on extreme conditions, on conditions where you have the uh, 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 labor pool which can be forced to work in those conditions. Generally, they don't have visas, they, you know, they're insecure in terms of their location in the country, so you're drawing on a pool of cheap labor and you are definitely part of the uh, uh, non-regulating capitals. In this case, non-regulating capitals with possibly lower costs, but they cannot use their lower costs to take over the whole city, so to speak, because their conditions are not reproducible. So they are local pockets. They're not free from competition. They still have to sell their goods at the same price. But the difference is that they can make a higher uh, profit margin because they have lower costs. And part of what I abstracted from what I said in the beginning is that the equalization of wages applies to where uh, wage equalization can take place. And this is an instance of a pool within a country. Now, if it's in another country, that's a diff it's a different matter because there, it's like having different land. You have basically a condition of production where you get excess profit, maybe, uh, until others reproduce. It's not clear, by the way. The, another country, the location is something that labor cannot necessarily cost, but capital can. Capital is perfectly happy to go there. And that's exactly how countries take advantage of that. India, China, Indonesia say, come to us. 
North Carolina says, we've got cheaper labor, come to us. So even though North Carolina labor may not move to New York City or New Jersey, the capital will definitely move there. And this is a constant theme. In the mobility uh, of capital is the other side of the mobility of labor. So you don't need the mobility of labor per se. In all of the standard factor price equalization models, they say abstractly, we don't need mobility of labor because the mobility of capital will make the wages equal. Now that's not true. But it does compensate for the immobility of labor if the conditions are there, which is transportation, uh, infrastructure, governance, ability to take your profits out, and all of that. Yeah? Um, wait. But there are uh, sort of structural differences between, say, unionized workers and precarious. Um, and they exist, in fact, in the business. To a certain extent, it's about that, it's about that difference. And sure. we are not necessarily in good countries. It's true that it's Western countries like China, Obama, Russia, and so forth. But we see them in New York City, for instance. It's just the central Absolutely. But what that tells us is that those are not the regulating capitals anymore. The regulating conditions come where capital can expand and reproduce. I mean, Uber is an example, right? New York City. If you want to be a taxi driver, you have to buy medallion. Medallion prices went up to a quarter million, half a million, because uh, demand was rising and the supply was very limited. Uber comes along, now suddenly Uber is the regulating price for taxis. And the medallion price is dropping because the demand for taxis at those prices as opposed to Uber is dropping. That's a transition from the old regulating capital for taxis, which are these taxi industries, to the <coughs> new one. And that transition should not be understood to be instantaneous or anything like that. It's a struggle between two different forms. And if Uber continues to expand and win, the price of taxi services goes down, definitely. Those medallions become worthless. I mean, there are people who worked their whole life to get that medallion, to, to own one, so that they didn't have to depend on some owner. And now it's becoming to the point where they can't get rid of it, and they've spent more money on the medallion than they, they just did something else. Okay, so that's part of the, tr of the the dynamics of competition, losers and winners. Okay, let me just do one more thing. I know I didn't get your chance to have questions or a break, but I need to finish this part, which is <coughs> how do, what are the conditions that determine the choice of new methods of production? There are two issues, the generation of new methods. But every firm, every capitalist, every research, business research institute is uh, paying people for new methods. And they, when, uh, in the United States, when the U.S. got to a certain point, they began to heavily invest in sailing ship technology. First they did railroads, because they want to get the stuff from one part to another. And the government helped, but they were also private railroads. But they wanted to invest in fast sailing ships. Why? Because the market of, for materials and for finished products in Europe had to be reached. And how do you get from there? You can't do it by railroad. So you need to develop ship technology. And businesses are very important in developing ship technology. Same thing for communications. How did you know what was happening in the stock market in the US if you were in England? Well, ships. There was no other way. Birds can't fly that far. From France, you could have a pigeon. But from the US, definitely didn't work. So the ships. But the ships also developed signaling devices, semaphores, to give information because the first one to get it can make a killing in the stock market. Oh, corn harvest was really good. The price of corn is going to go down. Sell now. It was really bad. Buy now. And the ships would come and they would signal. And so there was a competition among for communications, competition for transportation, and of course for spying. This is warfare. Advertising is propaganda. Mobility of capital is the invasion of territory. That's what all it is. And uh, uh, signaling and spying is a very important way of getting information. Companies will buy other people. That's why they have no compete agreements, by the way, which are routinely ignored. Uh, it's not often worth pursuing, but anyway, the point is that the analogy to warfare is very sharp. And if you look in the business literature, they say you want to study the art of warfare if you want to be in business. What you don't want to do is study. Uh, Varian or Mas Kalel. 
You don't want to talk about a firm that's passive and maximizes profit and doesn't affect anybody else and it just does what is good for itself and therefore it's good for the rest of the world. They're not interested in that. If they hire you as an economist, don't admit that you read Miles Kalel because they'll definitely have to get rid of you. Okay, one more point. Profit rate. Profit rate can be written as unit price, uh, as a profit margin over capital intensity, but you can think of that as price, uh, price minus unit costs over capital per unit output, physical output. But if you divide through by price, then it is cost per unit price and capital per unit price, or in other words, cost sales margin and capital to sales intensity. That's how the business literature does it. And the reason for that is simple. If you're aggregating an industry, you don't have a single price. But you have the money value, which is sales. So you can divide cost by sales, which is money also, and capital by sales, which is money, so you get these dimensionless ratios. Now, the question is, how do you choose? Uh, I do this every time. Suppose that your choice of technology was one in which uh, you have to choose lower costs. I mean, that's the argument I'm making, right? So if this is a range of all the technological possibilities, then this part is the space that you want to be in, right? You want lower costs if you're going to survive in a war of competition. If, there's, if it's neutral, the costs this is the change in unit cost and this is the change in capital intensity. If there's a neutral range of possibilities, so lower costs are not associated in particular with any change in capital intensity, then the average is going to be in the center of this half space. Everybody with me? That's just statistically, because a lot of concrete factors that determine individual technologies, individual markets, and so on. So stochastically, you're going to end up here, which means that your cost will go down, but your capital intensity will be roughly the same as before. There will be no rising organic composition of capital, but costs will be falling, definitely. If, however, costs, lower costs come because of expansion of scale and expansion of capital intensity, then the possibility space is going to be biased in the sense that you have uh, a tendency for lower costs to be associated with more capital intensive production. And so this is the shape of the curve and the feasible space is where costs are lower and capital intensity is higher because that's the available space. So you're going to be in the center of that somewhere stochastically, right? It doesn't matter the center. But the point is then you're going to get an association of lower cost, the change in the unit labor cost is negative with higher capital intensity, which is a higher capital cost. And that's just a stochastic thing, but if that's the case, then you get the argument in Marx of a falling rate of profit. This is called Marx bias technical change, by the way, in the literature. And what that basically says is that if you can model this as your unit labor costs are some initial cost <coughs> times a factor, uh, which is a product, a factor of time, and this is a uh, one minus something, so this is less than one, so this unit costs are falling. And capital intensity, one plus B times T, so they're rising. Then the profit rate can be decomposed into this initial cost, the cost reduction factor, the capital intensity reduction factor, and you get a very surprising result, which is that the profit rate, other things being equal, will be decomposable into two terms, one over the cost reduction factor and one plus B over the cost reduction factor. And you can easily show that in this simple illustration, the profit rate will tend to fall at some point. I'm, I'm going to skip the details of this because it's in the book, but it's simple baby algebra. But you will get only two types of paths for the profit rate. You get a path in which it rises at first and it falls, or you get a path in which it falls, once it begins falling, it falls. If capital 
a lower cost of production are stochastically, statistically associated with higher <coughs> costs, uh, higher um, uh, capital intensity. Now, what's the relevance of this? I want to just bring it back to the idea of a cost curve. In the business literature, they say the following. Suppose we have uh, average cost, fixed cost curve, and we have a prime cost curve, average variable cost curve, and the sum of these two is some kind of average cost curve, right? That's basic algebra. Actual cost curves don't look like that, but that's another issue uh, I can come back to if you want. What the business literature says is that what your technical change does is to lower this, but the cost of lowering this is to increase that. In other words, in order to get lower costs, you have to commit a larger quantity of fixed capital on average. And not for every industry and every time, but it's a general drift. And that therefore, these two have to add in such a way that the cost curve, average cost goes down. So average variable costs, you reduce prime costs. Raise the productivity of labor, labor cost goes down. You process materials more rapidly, the materials cost goes down. And the average cost curve has to go down. And business literature treats this rise in the average cost curve, average variable, average fixed cost curve, as being essentially the paradigmatic case, because they see it so often. But if that is true, then it necessarily implies that Statistically, stochastically, capital intensity will rise a little bit over time. Not from any aggregate, but from all the individual decisions. Some of you may have be lucky to get a new technology that lowers your costs and lowers your capital intensity. Others will have the opposite, lower costs and much higher capital intensity. But the average, if it's in that direction, will produce this kind of result. Now I bring this up because this is, relates obviously to two important questions, the Okisho theorem which is based on the idea that firms do not set prices. And this is based on the idea that firms do set prices, and they set them according to their ability to lower costs. So the key factor is not price, taking the prices given, but choosing the lower cost in order to be able to reduce price. And I talked about this in 1978 in a paper essentially criticizing uh, the existing Marxist literature, Romer, um, um, Andrew Glynn and others, as well as the Sropians, all of whom treat competition in the same way that neoclassical theory treats it. It really astonishes me how people say, well, we're taking this from Marx uh, and Samuelson, who are essentially the same. And I'm not the only one to say that Marx and Samuelson are the same. The monthly review school has in one of their, and I cite this in the book, a description of competition. How do you know that it's monopoly? Well, it doesn't look like competition. What is competition? And they say, Milton Friedman explains what competition is. So I actually happened to have read Milton Friedman because that was the textbook I used as a graduate student, thanks to Gary Becker, and it was about perfect competition. So you get trapped into thinking that competition is perfect competition, and then what you see must be due to monopoly. How do you know that? Well, they're big. Oh, big is bad because, you know, in perfect competition, they have to be small. I want to reverse the argument. Big is the means of competition. It allows you to be more competitive, more heartless. Um, one more point. In the first issue of the Cambridge Journal of Economics, there's an article from a man who worked in the, uh, on these issues, Jim Clifton, and he makes the following point. He says that people say that if one firm owns a lot of industries, then it's a kind of monopoly because they won't compete. And he says, no, that's exactly false. He actually worked for the agency that monitors these firms. He says, that's false. If you own pizza making, tomato making, steel making, and uh, iPhone making in one firm, when you make your profits, where are you going to put your money? If you put it back in your own firm, you're going to put it back in the portion of your firm that makes the biggest profit. And in fact, he says those firms are more ruthless in their competition because they don't care 
which country, which region, which nationality. The Kentucky Fried Chicken doesn't care whether you're in the West or the East. They only care where they can make more money. So his argument is that scale actually intensifies competition because it intens intensifies the mobility of capital. There are no personal attachments, no regional attachments, no language attachments. They go for where the rate of return is higher. So they are, in that sense, purer in their evaluation of alternatives. Okay, I'm almost out of time, and I think I've run through. I've, I haven't even touched on the empirical evidence that I wanted to, but this at least ends that part. Now I'm already a lecture and a half behind. So I have to ask you, because we have two things possible. One is macro, and the other is the crisis. It's unlikely I'll be able to do both. I, I do want to talk a little bit about macro. I haven't even finished the empirical evidence here. So I'm going to say, I, I'm going to skip part of the empirical evidence, which is chapter eight in the book, which is about why I, I would argue there is no evidence of for monopoly power. That all the phenomena that are typically used to establish monopoly power come because they mistake what is a natural consequence of competition for monopoly because they're always doing imperfect competition. So let me give you an example. You find a firm that has uh, a $2 million entry. Ah, that's a barrier to entry. A barrier to whom? That's a barrier to me, that's for sure. Barrier to the usual professor, yeah, that's for sure. Barrier to capital? A $100 million plant is not a barrier to capital. A billion dollar plant is not a barrier to capital because you can borrow the money or aggregate the money or, and it doesn't come from your personal account, it comes from your investors. So the idea that a barrier to entry is some a scale as a barrier to entry is due to the fiction that entry and exit in must be competitive if you're tiny. And I hope I've tried to persuade you that that's simply not the case. There's no evidence for it. Then on this you can look at whether there are any correlations between Concentration, which is the number of firms. If you have eight firms, that's called the eight firm concentration ratio. You take the percentage of sales held by eight firms. Any relationship between concentration ratio and profit margins? The answer is no. Is there any relationship between concentration of firms and profit rates? The answer is no. For every year where you can find such a relationship, in another year you find the opposite relationship. So if you look at it dynamically as this cycles of ups and downs, you see there isn't any. And this has become so much the case that the literature that began with Bain and the whole idea of imperfect competition in the 1950s has essentially collapsed. They admit now that every study they do, the next study proves them wrong. So they dropped it and they talk about more concrete factors, but they dropped the idea of monopoly power. They dropped the idea of markups related to concentration, scale, and so on. But those same phenomena can be derived from the patterns that I've talked about. And in that missing part of the book, of the chapter seven, I do two things. I trace a history of competition between Smith, Ricardo, and Marx. Most people have no clue that there was another theory of competition before Friedman. And then go on to talk about uh, the rise of perfect competition, the rise of imperfect competition, John Robinson, Chamberlain, Kaletsky, uh, and the post-Keynesian school and all of that and try to make the point that where they're talking about empirical phenomena, it is exactly what you expect from a model of competition, real competition. When they're talking about claims that monopoly power and concentration ratios, you don't find any evidence for this at all. Now, it doesn't mean that there's no such thing as monopoly. The question is, how would you know if it's a monopoly? You can't say because it's big, because that's certainly part of competition. You can't say that it's slow entry and exit, that scale issues and perfectly reserve capacity. Well, if you're bigger, you're not going to jump in. So if demand goes up, you're going to use more of your existing capacity. If you're small, you might jump in and then jump out because you have less to lose. So reserve capacity is related to scale. But that does not imply something uh, inefficient. On the contrary, it's very efficient because it prevents you from jumping in with something that's going to be unused until there's enough demand for it. So all of those phenomena, uh, I would argue, are based on an attachment to and ultimately an allegiance to the theory of perfect competition. Because once you get attached to it to prove that you're not like them, you then have to prove that they're important because otherwise you're not like something that's not important. And what's the point of doing anything then? 
So you become attached to showing that that church is important in order to prove that you're important because you know where the church went wrong, at least you know which bishop was bad. Uh, I'm urging you to try to step back and say, look, if we had to start this from scratch, what would we do? How would it look? And then the empirical evidence falls into place. Uh, I'm gonna skip that because I didn't get to it today at all, but that's at chapter seven. Take a look at chapter seven. Tomorrow, I'd be happy to talk about it. But what I wanna move on to is the next step in the argument, which is a, the argument I've made here turns out to be the foundation for the theory of macroeconomics of effective demand. And the reason is, I've argued here that the ith firm, investment of the ith firm is a function of its expected profit rate in excess of the interest rate. Why do you need the interest rate? Because you're not going to bother if you only get what you can get from the bank, right? So if your expected rate of return on regulating capitals, so that's what the star is, <coughs> on regulating capitals, is what determines mobility of capital across sectors. Well, that same thing implies in the aggregate. So this is individual firm. And this is the aggregate. That same thing will imply that investment is a function of prof expected profit rate, really regulating rate, to be precise, investment. And this is exactly what Marx has and Keynes. I'm sorry, you can't see it? OK, right in black. So this movement from the individual, yeah, I see what you mean. Individual firm profit rate is a function of the expected rate of return in excess of the interest rate. But aggregating that up will give you also investment. I said inv investment depends on that difference. Investment depends on the same thing in the aggregate. And that is Marx exact, explicitly, he calls this profit rate of enterprise. And in Keynes, he calls this marginal efficiency of capital minus the interest rate. So both of these here are actually explicitly <coughs> mentioned as central to aggregation, to uh, aggregate movements. But that is the foundation, the analytical foundation of the theory of effective demand. In Keynes, this is how you start. Investment depends, is given on profitability, and you have a fixed savings propensity, a consumption propensity, that's a multiplier, right? But you already have that in Marx and you already have it in the classical tradition of equalization of profit rates. The difference is that Marx links this expected profit rate back to the actual profit rate. And Keynes leaves this hanging in the air. It doesn't mean he wouldn't have done it. You know, he died quite young. Keynes died of heart disease quite young after an enormous labor trying to set up not only the theory but policy in advanced countries, uh, Bretton Woods, the, all the arrangements. Um, so we don't know. Maybe he would have gone back. He doesn't have a theory of competition. That's clear. But when he talks about competition, it's very clearly not neoclassical competition. So I'm going to argue next time that you can ground Keynes properly, that his own argument leads back to the theory of real competition and indeed leads back to the idea that investment is determined by the real conditions of profitability. And that means that now we have a, a unified theory, classical foundations for uh, um, real competition. Keynes is, would have no trouble with what I did with consumer theory. That's pretty obvious if you read Keynes. So we have that foundation, and that implies also a place for Keynesian uh, economics. And then we can talk about the effect of governments.
printing money and finance and all of that stuff, uh, which I want to talk about, including what I've written recently about the problem that might be facing Britain if Corbyn comes into power, the limits. So I want to do that next time, and if I get there, then on Friday, we're going to talk about the crisis, the current crisis. Always I will use the same framework. Always it will be the same consistent framework. I don't need to invent. That's not to say they're not concrete factors, but I don't need to invent new hypotheses, and that's what I mean by unified. And that's what I admire about neoclassical theory, and indeed about post-Keynesian theory, because they're consistent. But this is a different one. Okay, folks. Uh, you have been very polite and sat through this whole thing, so time for pizza and beer, and then uh, tomorrow to continue. <laughs>